Today on The Snack Covenant, episode 304. <laughs> You're ruining my childhood memories of linen! For more Elden Ring lore, visit patreon.com slash Sinclair lore. And now, today's episode of The Snack Covenant. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. And welcome to The Snack Covenant, episode... 394? What? You fucking heard it. I think it's supposed to be 304. It wouldn't surprise me if we were on episode 394 by this point. <laughs> like, it's just... <laughs> We've sacrificed quality for quantity and received nothing in return. Today we're talking about Marika and death. So, Marika and death is something that we kind of touched on before. We're going to go into a little more detail about it now. But because we're kind of trying to break this down into manageable little chunks. All the stuff about like the Glomied Queen and things like that, like that'll be a separate episode. Thank you, Sophie. And for the purpose of these podcasts, we're assuming that people have an understanding of Elden Ring. And if you don't know what Elden Ring is, we actually did quite a few episodes on it. If you don't know what Elden Ring is and you're listening to this Elden Ring podcast. Well, maybe they came here for the born. <laughs> I was literally just about to say that. Late at night, I think of you, your vision floods my mind. So, Sophie. Yes. Marika. Marika. Death. Death. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> Alright, so we're going to start by first differentiating, because this is something that confused us at the time. Um, differentiating exactly what is meant by, like, Golden Order, Elden Ring, and Greater Will. <laughs> the Greater Will is, like, a cosmic space entity, and it's something that we never really directly interact with, and the implication is that it's something that's just completely inhuman. And if you look at the way it's interacting with the world around it, it never directly does it. It has to do it through what it's calling vassals. So it uses things like the two fingers to talk to people, or it talks to people like through Queen Marika, things like that. There's like this chain of command that like goes from the greater will to the Erd Tree to Gold Mask, or like from the greater will to the fingers to the finger reader. So the greater will... What we do know about it is that, like, it appears to be a colonizing force. Like, it wants to take over planets. And the way in which it has attempted to colonize the lands between is it sent something that is within the game's world called the Elden Ring. The Elden Ring also takes the form of a creature called the Elden Beast, but that's not super important now. The point is that the Elden Ring is like, it's like a fragment of the Greater Will's power. But... Because the Greater Will is something that is completely alien to this planet. Presumably it's alien to every planet apart from its own if it even has one. So, like, it could land on, like, the lands between. But it could also land on, like, a planet like a gas giant or something. Or it could land on, like, a planet that's just a big ocean or something. And when we talked about this on What, Where, Why, Episode 3, What is the Elden Ring on Patreon. We did, yeah. We discussed what would happen if it landed on planet Twitter. Yes, yes, Planet Twitter. So if you're curious. <laughs> Hello, Elana the Squalid Queen here. You know, I wish I lived on Planet Twitter, spending all day interacting with my millions of subjects. Or at least I would think that if it weren't for all those people who insist on talking back. That's why I'm announcing a new grassroots campaign to raise funds so that I, Elana, can buy Twitter. Donation link in the description. Uh, crypto only, please, as I'm still on the PayPal naughty step. For further information on why I personally should be above criticism, please read my new detective novel. Back to the podcast. So it sends this Elden Ring thing down, right? The Elden Ring is like a fragment of the Greater Will's power that has to work through a vassal. The vassal sort of fuses with the Elden Ring. You see this with the endings with Queen Marika, where Queen Marika, like her corpse literally has bits of the Elden Ring sticking out of it. 
And at the end of it, if you choose to repair the rune, you actually like fit a rune back into Queen Marika's body. And if you listen to Enya, the lady at Round Table Hold, like she explains it as like, yeah, Queen Marika has trespassed against the greater will. We're all really mad at her. But because she's literally got the Elden Ring in her, we need to keep her alive. So there's this whole like weird power structure going on where like Queen Marika's got the power of the Elden Ring and the power of the Greater Will, but her, so even if the Greater Will like rejects her and the two fingers turn on her and the Erd Tree turns on her, they sort of can't do anything because she's just got this chunk of power in her. You know what you're making me think of? You know, like Independence Day when the aliens show up. See, when you said Independence Day, I wasn't sure if you were going to go down the road of, like, this is like when the American colonies <laughs> seceded from the British Empire. <laughs> or it was going to be, this is like the movie where A. Will Smith fights aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they both work, but God. Fun fact, I was fairly young when we moved to Canada. Yeah. And... Back in the Soviet Union, we didn't learn about what Independence Day was. Yeah, yeah. I was very surprised that they named a holiday after a movie when I found out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you, Sam. (laughs) What are we talking about? God. Are you tired of your conversations going off on pointless tangents? Then you need your own angelic outline. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the top 10 Satan Tango facts to ruin your childhood. Get yours today, only from GlockensPyromancyAcademy.com So Queen Marika has the Elden Ring. The Elden Ring is like a fragment of the Greater Will's power. It's like a conduit of power from the Greater Will. The Golden Order is what Marika did with the Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. So that's how it, it functions. Like the Greater Will is the entity that's the source of the power. The Elden Ring is a conduit for the Greater Will's power. And the Golden Order is what Marika did with the Elden Ring. So, you know, we talk about the greater will as something unknowable, almost like the color out of space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what if it's just a committee of a bunch of entities? It might be. What if they're actually really knowable? Well, they might be. What if it's actually a bunch of humans from the future coming back to the past to remake planet Elden Ring the way they want it to be in the future? Okay, we're we're one third of the way into our allocated recording time, and we haven't discussed either of the topics. So good, good. So Sophie. Yes. Now that we understand the Greater Will, the Elden Ring, colonization, and noble entities, tell me about Marika. So Marika is a character that we have almost no direct interaction with, but she sort of looms large over the story. We never directly, like, hear Marika's words spoken, but Melina will sometimes say at certain sites of grace that the echoes of Marika's speech are here, and she'll, like, relay something Marika said. What we know of Marika's past is, like, very sort of vague, but it looks very much like she is a survivor slash the creation of a prior civilization. Like, she's not, like, a normal human. She's not a normal human like Godric. What we know of Queen Marika's past, it's all talked about in sort of, like, rumors and whispers. There's three key items I want to talk about here. So the first is there's a thing called a Newman's Rune, which is N-U-M-E-N. And it mentions that, like, this, uh, it's a rune, it's sort of, it's like the the soul items in Dark Souls are used, it gives you runes. And it says, like, yeah, this is, this rune is from someone called a Numen. And the Numen were, like, very, very sort of powerful, they had all this golden runic stuff inside them. And then it specifies that they came from outside of the Lands Between. When we're making a character, we have the option of selecting Numen as, like, a preset appearance. 
Um, it doesn't change anything about us statistically. It's just a look. <laughs> but it says, like, the new men are people, they're very, very long-lived, but they're very rarely born. And weirdly, we find a lot of Newman runes inside of ants. And it's not clear to me if that means that that the ants, like, absorbed a whole lot of golden crap into them. Or it's like, this is something that happens in uh, in Dark Souls a lot, where the rats will drop humanity. I think the implication there is, like, the rats were just eating people, and they got all this humanity gunk in them. And I think that is what's happening with the ants, um, if I had to pick one of those explanations. Or, or the ants are Newman's closest relative. But that's possible because like what we were saying with the the greater will, like it at some point conceivably might have to take over a planet that's run by ants, in which case that probably would what would happen. I feel like a planet run by ants would be much better than a planet run by humans. Do you know who would be the ant queen? No. Yes, you do. Oh, the one from Dark Souls 2. There is a much I wouldn't do to be sure. of time (laughs) so we find newman runes in the underground areas of elden ring and we also find a lot of them in ants there's kind of like two possible explanations there the first one is that the ants are just getting all of this golden stuff in them right and that's entirely possible because like the Erd trees talked about as like a plant and like the power comes out of like sap and dew and things that come from the tree. And you can imagine like ants store sugar and things in their bodies. And the ants that you get the Newman runes from, they have huge, huge, huge like bloated abdomens, which is something that some ants do, like where they just absorb tons and tons of sugar and just swell up. It looks exactly like that. So it's possible they got it directly from the Erd tree because they're under it. It's also possible that they just ate people. So I think it's more likely that the ants just ate the Newman and they gained like their runic powers inside them. That's sort of the genesis of the Newman. Like we don't know very much about them, but they're like very long lived people. They come from outside of the lands between. So to be clear, like the lands between is just the area the game is set. So there's other places outside of that we hear about, like the land of reeds is one of them. The badlands is another. Those aren't the lands between. And the underground portion of it is also, I'm assuming, not the lands between it, because it's just a completely different place. This is called the Eternal City. So they come from outside the lands between. So we find them in the Eternal City sort of underground areas, which says to me that, like, okay, the Newman probably came from here. That is further backed up by the description on the Black Knife set. So if we look at the Black Knife set, it says... The assassins that carried out the deeds were all women and rumored to be Newman who had close ties to Marika herself. So again, we have like Marika and the Newman are connected. The Black Knife plot, which we'll get into later on, it's very, very tied to the Eternal Cities. Um, not necessarily in terms of like it's from there, but it's like it's a it's a replay of something that happened there. And it says specifically, like, again, those women were Newman. So there's Newman walking around and they're closely tied to Marika. So the third item I want to bring in is Marika's Saw Seal. Marika's Saw Seal is an item that kind of embodies what Marika has to deal with as the sort of like linchpin of the world. It's like it's the embodiment of like it talks like Marika is sort of cursed and it's eating away at her. And it's an item that like simultaneously it raises a bunch of your stats, but it also makes you weaker in other ways. So the idea is like this is sort of an embodiment of what it's like to be the queen. Like, you, you, you have all this additional power, but also this thing is weighing on you and sort of it's also making you weaker. That item is found in the Eternal Cities. The exact layout of them is slightly confusing. It's in the, it's near the Siofra Aqueduct. The point is, like, it's at the bottom of a waterfall. If you follow the waterfall up, you get to another waterfall. But if you follow that waterfall up, you get to a ruined Eternal City that doesn't have a name. Um, It's just called the Nameless Eternal City. And... That is very, very close to the impact point of the Greater Will's sort of like vassal star thing. The The game uses the word star sort of interchangeably to mean like it could mean meteorite, it can mean comet, it can literally mean star, it can also mean like hunk of glintstone, it can mean all these things. It's just for anything in the sky that's not the moon is a star, basically. So it's impacted there, and you can sort of like follow that downstream to where Marika's source seal is. So 
all in all, it looks very much like Marika came from these underground cities. Like, that's her genesis. She came from these underground cities. That's why she sort of was able to to commune with the Elden Ring. It's, like, where she was able to find it. The exact, like, nature of the timeline is a little weird, but if you kind of assume that, like, a lot of, like, important sort of Marika-related events also seem to take place in this area. So you've got, like, this is where the Erd Tree starts to grow. It's also, I think, roughly where the Crucible is supposed to be. So everything about Marika says, like, she's tied to these underground cities. And once she had the power to sort of, like, make her own world, to create, like, what we know of as the Golden Order, she left. And she went to the surface, and that's when, like, her and Godfrey slay the giants and control the forge and everything to to keep the world safe, and the Earth Tree begins to grow. (laughs) And what we know specifically about the Golden Order is that she creates it, it says specifically, she creates it by confining death. So that's kind of where we're going to go from here. We're going to talk about, like, Marika and, like, why she is trying to confine death, why that's important, and sort of where that leads the story. Thank you, Sophie. So essentially, we're going to talk about Marika's psychology. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me about her childhood. Interesting that you bring that up, Sin, because I know that's a joke, but (laughs) I think we do need to talk about Marika's childhood. So if we assume Marika is from the Eternal Cities, then like, let's look at how the Eternal Cities relate to death. Mm-hmm. They love it. <laughs> Everything in the Eternal Cities is just like skulls and corpses. Maybe they're just really goth. Well, no, but they, they probably were. <laughs> no, but like the Eternal Cities, if you look at them, like the decor, the decor is specifically what's called ghost flame, which is literally burning bones. <laughs> they seemingly worshipped corpses in chairs. Mm-hmm. One of them is in a chapel. Like, it's like it's in the church at the end of it. It's like where you would be praying. Mm-hmm. The thing about them is, like, the dominant color of the Eternal Cities is silver. Like, everything is either silver or sort of like a bluish light. The corpses in the chairs are the only things that are wearing, like, a significant amount of gold. And gold is the color that's associated with the greater will. Mm-hmm. So it looks very much like these corpse things, they would have been the sort of demigod equivalents, like they were the vassals of the greater will at that. It was speaking through these huge people in chairs. It is not clear if they were alive or dead at the time. So everything about the Eternal Cities is like, it's either death or it's also lifeless. Because they talk about like, there was life in the Eternal Cities, but it took the form of these things called the Silver Tears. And the Silver Tears are basically the T-1000. They're like these masses of liquid metal that can take on other forms. They're just blobs. And the silver tears, like, they are alive. They do appear to be sentient. But they also made, like, weapons and things out of the silver tears. So it's like it's like a sentient alloy that they had there. So, like, there's life there, but the life takes the form of an inanimate metal. Again, there's, like, vegetation there, but the vegetation is silver. Like, it looks like almost metal. It doesn't look like it's, like, a beautiful flower or something. Mm -hmm. So everything about the Eternal Cities, it's, like, either it's literally just in your face, like, death. It's, like, statues of weird screaming faces and, like, burning skulls and stuff and just giant corpses in chairs. Or it's something that is, like, sterile. The people that live in the Eternal City are called the Nox, and we see them worshipping the Silver Tears. Like, they literally, at some point, they start to worship metal. And interestingly, it does specify that the Silver Tears were their attempt to create, like, a new lord. Like, they were making this living metal in the hopes that one day, like, it would... It talks about it being, like, born and born and born again. Like, it sort of, it, like, takes on a form and then it cracks out of, like, a chrysalis and it becomes something else. And their hope was that one day, like, that would be reborn as a lord. Like, they they would create their own sort of, like, master out of this, like, not living but also not living metal. So kind of like the one reborn. Exactly, yes. And that's where, like, that's what the mimic tear is. Mm -hmm. Like, the idea is, like, the mimic tear is sort of taking other forms. Um, It is actually entirely possible that Marika is that. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like they were trying to make, like it's going to make our own Lord. We're going to make our own Lord. We're going to make our own Lord. And it's possible Marika was actually like spat out at some point. Okay. Like Marika started life as like a pile of slime that then sort of became the Lord. So tangentially, because like, I know it will come up. People was like, well, actually, there's a lot of life and there's a lot of animals and things in the Eternal Cities. But all those things are actually outside of, like, the structures. If you go outside of the structures, places like the Siofra River, you can see, like, there's all these animals running around. There's all of these trees. That's where the ancestral people are. You see these people and they have these, like, big horned headbands and they're performing these rituals. And it says they keep far away from the Erd tree. That's a little odd because later on we see them worship one. But we'll just say that's like a breakaway sect, I guess. But the point is, like, they keep far away from the Erd tree and they they disdain metal. Like, they don't use metal working. And the look of the ancestral people, very, very close to the look of the Nox. Like, it's like they have the same sort of unnaturally, like, stone-like sort of gray skin. So it looks like these are two groups sort of, like, within the same civilization. It's just like... The Nox were sort of like the high-ranking people that lived within the cities, and then the ancestral people were like the outcast. The ancestral people also venerate the dead. You find them praying to corpses, like they will inter a corpse. These are the corpses of like their animal gods. In the same way, I think the corpses in the chairs, like this is the ancestral version of that. You get like a giant, it's like a huge sort of elk corpse. They inter it in like a church, like a, a temple thing, like it's a god. And they literally just worship a dead body. There's also the ancestral shamans. They also use like skulls from the same species. They use a child of an, like an elk. There's all these weird like elk deer things. The ancestral followers, like they will hold up those skulls and use them to like worship with. It's like a catalyst. So the whole of the underground is obsessed with people dying. That's where Marika comes from. Okay. Marika's first action is, she says, I am going to remove death from the Elden Ring. So when you said, let's go back to Marika's childhood, I think that's absolutely, (laughs) no, I think that's completely right. Because I think she came from that place. Because we also know, like, the Eternal Cities collapsed. Like, that whole civilization imploded. It all fell apart. They became infested with, like, the Scarlet Rot. Estelle broke through and, like, apparently just siege them with meteorites until like the city was completely destroyed it's all crumbling and falling to pieces and that is because they killed the vassals of the greater will this is part of rani's quest rani makes you go to nokron which is one of the eternal cities and she makes you get a thing called the finger slaying blade and it says very specifically that the people of the eternal cities they turned against the greater will and they used this thing called the finger slaying blade that it specifies was that they made it from a corpse. They took this thing and they killed the vassals of the greater will, and that's what broke the city. Because when they destroyed the vassals of the greater will, for all the greater will's problems, it was protecting them. It had put this like sort of barrier up, like, like I am in charge of this place. And once it went away, it was a free for all. And suddenly you got Estelle breaking through and also the Scarlet Rod got through. So Marika, Clearly, if she's from here, she is very, very aware of like, oh, if you mess around with death, this is what happens. So it makes absolute sense from her point of view to be like, okay, now that I'm in charge, we're getting rid of this thing. This death is nothing but trouble. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to stick it in a dog. (laughs) And I think like it's very, very fitting that like what Marika does when she establishes her order is she creates the Erd tree. So Marika creates a tree, and what is a tree? A tree is life. It's something that just endlessly reproduces itself. And we see that throughout the lands between the Erd tree will not stop growing. Mm-hmm. Like there's the massive Erd tree at the center, and then all around it, like the there's these gold plants growing that weren't there before, and then it's taking the form of what are called like phantom trees. So you see little tiny Erd trees growing out of the ground. You see very big, they're called minor, but they're still massive, like massive minor Erd trees growing up, which are themselves starting to spawn these like strange like wood monsters. So the Erd tree is like its life and it won't stop growing. And that's like, that's the antithesis of the Eternal Cities because they were death. So Marika from there is like, okay, I'm going to start my own order. And I am not going to repeat the mistakes of the Eternal Cities. I will make sure death is not allowed here. Okay. 
This is what leads us to Malekith. Now, Sin. Yes. As the resident Slav, are you familiar with the story of Koshe the Deathless? Very much so, Sophie. Oh, good. So, Sin, can you relay to us concisely what happens with Koshe the Deathless? Okay. So, Koshe Bismirny is basically a wizard anti hero in Slav folklore. And he's technically immortal. And Kashe is immortal because he hides his soul very well. Typically, his soul is hidden inside a needle that is hidden inside other objects. So, for example, it could be hidden in an egg, which is in a duck, which is in a hair, which is in a chest, which is in a secret place. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, Kashe's ability to defeat death actually inspired Dr. Stephen Strange to go into medicine. I was unaware of that. There's also uh, another thing uh, you may or may not be aware of. The Kashe Russian Mafia family claimed to have have dissented Kashe and practiced teaching from Russian folklore. They settled in New York City and the kingpin intruded their territory. They felt threatened and summoned Baba Yaga. <laughs> who escaped their control and took control over Kashe. Oh, this is good. I have to read that. It's like Slav Jerry Springer. I'm assuming that like that this is this is like a Daredevil comic or something. This happens on Earth 616. That's where most of it happens. Is Earth 616 Elden Ring? Well, we're on Earth 616. Oh. So we have Elden Ring here. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sin. So the reason that I, I wanted you to talk about Cachet the Deathless is that this is kind of what happens with Marika. So Marika takes death out of the Elden Ring, right? And she puts that inside of Malekith. Uh-huh. Malekith's not very happy with this arrangement. Um, If you listen to him talk about it, it's a combination of like, this is my solemn duty, but also like, oh, this is not good. He refers to himself as, like, having been gulled by Marika, like she, like, tricked him and betrayed him. And also, like, this, uh, I think the remembrance of Malekith specifies, like, yeah, Marika actually just betrayed him. She's like, I'm going to get death and I'm going to shove it in you. And you're going to go and you're going to stay at the center of time in Faramazula so that no one can get death out of you. Do you think she did it by putting death in, like, one of those tablet capsules? And feeding it to him, and he thought it was a snack. Grind it up and put it in his dog food. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like similar in a sense to Cache. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, I'm going to get the one thing that can harm me, and I'm going to put it in a series. It's like a matryoshka doll. This like overly complicated thing that like this, so no one can get it anymore. But also like Cache, that ends up being her undoing. Because once you know where it is, you can just steal it. And that's what Rani does. Uh-huh. So Marika, because she is so paranoid about death, removes death from the ring to stop anyone from being able to hold it. But because it's now outside of the ring. Anyone can get to it. Anyone can get it. It's, you know, it's a very sort of like ironic kind of twist thing. It's sort of poetic that like she's so paranoid about death that her attempt to seal it away is actually what ends up letting it out. Because if it had just stayed in the ring, yeah, no one would have been able to steal it. Yeah. Yeah. Also interesting to point out that, like, Farum Azula is also obsessed with death. Like, it is essentially a giant mausoleum. Like, if you look at it, it is just every single wall has corpses interred in it. The floors have corpses in them. There's corpses lying everywhere. There are reanimated corpses. It's just corpses all over the place. Faramazul is confusing to talk about because it's described as like being outside of time. But like if you can talk about before and after with Faramazul, Faramazul seems to predate the Eternal Cities. And again, it is obsessed with death like they are. But while you're in Faramazul, you can see a design that looks to be the Elden Ring, except it's a much, much more complex version of it. Like, it has all these additional rings, additional lines and things to it. It's a way more complicated design. 
And that looks to be, like, probably the original form of the ring, before people started removing parts of it. And it's not, like, clear who removes what when, but, like, at Faramazula time, it's this, like, massively complex, like, design with all these circles and lines and wiggly bits and, like, interlining, like, interlocking helix designs and things. And by the time that we're fighting Marika, it's basically just four rings and an arrow. So a lot of stuff got removed from it. You can actually see like little bits of it sort of like in other designs, like part of it looks a lot like Mikola's rune. We also know that um, the Lord of Faramazula was Placidusax. But interestingly, when you fight Placidusax, like parts of his body have cracked off exactly like Marika's. He, he used to have four heads and now he has two. And you can see, like, the stumps are lying there. You can also see, like, he's very into um, five-fingered attacks, which is a greater will thing. So, like, it looks like what we're encountering here is, like, Placidus X kind of in the state Marika is in now, where, like, he's had the greater will in him, but, like, fractures and have sort of formed, and, like, his version of the ring appears to have been broken, and he suffered like Marika has. I don't know what Placidus X did, you could maybe say that, like, maybe Placidus X tried to remove the concept of time or something from the ring. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in Fire and you'll have, like, we'll talk about some other time because it's such a complicated place. Yeah. But, like, again, Fire and Masula also seems to be the genesis of the greater will giving dogs to people. Because Fire and Masula basically seems to be a bunch of dogs who worship a dragon that was, like, the conduit for the greater will. So I'm wondering if, like, this is when the Greater Will's like, okay, well, I control the dragons who control the beast people. So I guess from now on, everyone who signs up with me gets a free dog. <laughs> and that is where Malekith comes from. Mm-hmm. Marika shoves death inside of her dog. Oh. Yeah. Not nice. Yeah. But then what happens is, like we said, because it's inside the dog, it's not inside Marika, you can just walk up and take it. Once it's taken, like, that's kind of curtains for Marika because that's what kicks this whole thing off. Because now that Rune of Death has been stolen, Rani can start fucking with death. Yeah. And that's what leads to the death of Godwin. So, like, if Marika hadn't taken death out of the Elden Ring, Godwin wouldn't have died. Mm-hmm. And, like, there's so many different versions of the intro text, like, that, that we have because we have, like, I think three different trailers that are all clearly unused intros that have slightly okay. different versions of the story. But one of them, um, this is the story trailer on the Bamco YouTube channel. It specifies that like the death of Godwin is kind of what pushed Marika over the edge. Mm-hmm. And you can see how that works because it's like Marika so obsessed with stopping death. She ends up getting her firstborn killed. Yeah. That seems to have been like the catalyst for what broke her. And like, Godwin seems to have been, like, very, very, very important. Like, Godwin very much looks like he was going to be the success at America. Uh-huh. Um, everything about him, like, you don't... I don't want to say you don't see him. You don't see the Godwin that would have been the success at America. You see a giant dead fish, but you don't see, like, the real Godwin. Um, there's a couple of statues that might be Godwin. You see Godwin in the intro. Um, he's just, like, he kind of looks like Chris Hemsworth Thor. And you also see, like, there's a statue in the Halig tree of a figure that is, like, sheltering Mikola and Melania. And I'm fairly sure that's Godwin. It might be Radigan. You can't tell because the statue doesn't have any color to it. But I think it's supposed to be Godwin because the hair doesn't match Radigan. Mikola references Godwin as, like, brother. So they were alive at the same time. It's not like they were born very much later. There's also statues in Lindell of, like, a sort of robed figure with, like, sort of flowing hair and a spear. That might also be Godwin. Like, we hear about, like, Godwin fighting the dragons and stuff and eventually making friends with them, similar to Nameless King and Dark Souls. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to have been basically, like, they the, the dragons sort of like, this seems to have been a Godwin versus dragons thing that maybe is what led to them being able to like go to Farm Azula in the first place. I don't know. <laughs> mm. Hi, Sophie here. This podcast only has about 10 minutes left to go. So I'd just like to thank everybody who stuck with us for this long. 
Since a lot of you have probably already left comments about it, delete them now because I am well aware that I confused Marika's Scar Seal with Marika's Saw Seal. In my defense, uh, I think having a scar is probably worse than having a saw, so I assumed that the, that the Scar Seal was the good, like, strong one and the Saw Seal was the weaker one. Also, um, Sin says that uh, if you watch the podcast to the end, there's all sorts of surprises coming, including something that is she's calling the piano guitar. This uh, appears to be a teaser for the Snack Covenant Phase 6 story arc. Anyway, back to the final dregs of the podcast. So what happens when Godwin dies is... Marika kind of tries to cover it up, but she does it in a way that is, like, very consistent with her originally being from the Eternal Cities. Because Godwin is buried in the roots of the tree that are in the ruined Eternal City. Like, she actually takes him back there and she puts him there. This also leads to the proliferation of the Walking Mausoleums. The Walking Mausoleums are... Literally, they are a mausoleum that walks around. They have, a, like, a mausoleum on a rock. The rock has little rock feet, and it sort of wanders around, has a big bell that's chiming. And inside every mausoleum, there's a Lennon. Yes, there's a... Well, I mean, it has no head, so you can't prove it's not Lennon. <laughs> to be fair, like, Lennon's probably a little collapsed right now. I mean, there had to be a lot of embalming fluid. Oh, you just traumatized my childhood memory. <laughs> <laughs> You're ruining my childhood memories of Lennon! <laughs> um, so, the walking mausoleums, like, they are clearly also a Nox thing. Like, they're from the Eternal Cities, the same architectural style. Like, if you look at them, they do not fit aesthetically with the world around them. It's the same, like, architectural style, same colors, same, like, lighting they use in the Eternal Cities. So these things, like, they are from the Eternal Cities. And inside them are what they just call the soulless demigods. So these characters have no names. Um, if you're curious about, like, really who they are, it's Morgoth's model with the head removed. Okay. They do get called Marika's uh, unwanted offspring at one point. So I think the idea is, like, Marika post-Godwin death, like, there were a bunch of demigods who died in the same way Godwin did. Because Godwin's death is special, because the way Rani engineers it is that Godwin's soul dies, but his body doesn't. And Rani's the opposite. Rani's body dies, but her soul endures. Mm -hmm. So apparently post-Godwin, they end up being all these demigods that are either born or somehow end up with no souls. Okay. And they're described as Marika's offspring, and that actually makes sense when you consider, okay, it's a model of Morgoth. Like... He's also Marika's offspring. Of course, they look the same. So at least these walking mausoleums that, like, they clearly seem to have um, come from the Eternal Cities. I don't know if Marika, like, got them moved or something, or they just climbed out somehow. But, like, you can tell that, like, Marika and the sort of Golden Order peeps, they've been down in the Eternal Cities again because Godwin's buried there. And also there are the gargoyles that they use to defend Landell, like they're all over the place and they're specifically positioned to like stop you getting to godwin's corpse so like she's gone back there like she's actually gone back to where all the death was to put godwin there i think because she understood on some level that like this is the death place so this is where godwin belongs Uh but she also buries godwin inside of the tree so godwin's death ends up infecting the earth tree and that is what leads to, like, the weird face under Stormvale. It's what leads to, like, the death root growing, because Godwin's death, it's in the tree. As the tree is growing, it's starting to grow bits and pieces of Godwin. As for Godwin looking like a fish, I just want to say up front, like, before we go into, like, trying to talk about it, um, I've seen that mesh extracted from the game, and... Um, it's literally just a bunch of assets that don't fit together at all <laughs> jammed together um, with a waist cloth to hide the join. Okay. 
It's kind of like if you were like making your own custom Warhammer figures and two parts don't line up properly, so you like make a belt or something to go around it to hide the joint. It's a little like that. So okay. this is okay. something that I don't think is ever going to make perfect sense because I don't think it was supposed to be Godwin. But what I am going to say is like there's something about the look of Godwin that I think is supposed to evoke the basilisks because the basilisks are like a source of death blight. And they have, like, they have the same sort of fins on their arms. They also have, like, a fish tail. You can see eyes growing out of the tree where Godwin is. They have these, like, they look like basilisk eyes that are growing out of the tree. I think that they're repurposing assets to do this. But I think what they're trying to do now is they're trying to say, like, okay, Godwin in death is kind of like, he's like the lord of the basilisks now or something. They're like being born from his body or something like that. There's also like the way that the, that, um, the tibia mariners who are like a, an undead thing that's hunted by the golden order. Like they're connected to water, obviously being a mariner. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they, they sort of have these, like a, like a, a Charon figure that's sort of like, like a, an undead ferryman that rows this boat around. So like that's also sort of ties into the fish thing. And that whole fiasco is also what leads to the whole those who live in death situation. Because death is now completely corrupting everything. Okay. So you start getting like people and creatures and things that don't know how to die. So again, like Maricus trying to seal away death has now caused death to go wrong. Like it's not even like death is rampant in the lands between, death has gone wrong in the lands between. <laughs> The other thing about Marika and death that's related to this is the Tarnished. Because she is very clear that, like, her plan with the Tarnished is that they're going to die. She specifically says, I am going to divest you of your grace, you're going to be kicked out of the lands between, and then you're going to die. After you're dead, I'm going to take back what I gave you. So that seems to be, again, like, she is doing something to death. She is obsessed with the notion that, like, someone can die and then rise again. And I am wondering if the whole, like, if this is part of her plan, that she specifically wanted people who died and came back to life, sustained by the grace of the earth tree, because that would prevent them from becoming those who live in death, because their death is working differently. Like, they're, like, sustained purely by the gold. So, Sophie, what's the good ending in all of this? The Rani ending is the one that it does liberate the world from the greater will. However, in doing so, uh, Rani, had you kill her father, her stepmother, her brother, and her dog. So I'm not feeling confident. I think I'm next. Frenzied Flame is like doom pill shit. Um, that's just giving up. That's just YOLOing it and just burning everything down and starting again. So we're not going to do that. Gold Mask, totalizing narrative, no. <laughs> Dung Eater, self-explanatory, no. <laughs> Age of Fracture, we're just con continuing the world as it is. We don't want to do that. So I think the good ending of Elden Ring, honestly, is Fears. Okay. Because that's the one that, like, it puts death back in the ring. You can't undo the damage Marika did, but you can say, okay, but the damage she did, it's created basically undead people. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, undead people have a place in the world now. So you've basically created Dark Souls. <laughs> Hi, Sin here. Piano guitar was just a diversion to get everybody hyped. And unfortunately, we will not be revealing that today. However, as a thank you to all the cultists who watch the podcasts until the end, we would like to do a little giveaway. And we're giving away two Dignity City hoodies. Now, because YouTube doesn't have messaging and I would need to contact you to sort out the details, this giveaway will be done through Discord. Here's how you enter. Step 1. Click the Discord link in the description of this video. Step 2. Go to the room at the bottom, titled Secret Room. Step 3. Type the following message the policy. And that's how you enter. Thanks again for watching, listening, sharing our content, and encouraging us along the way. And have a wonderful rest of the day.